Welcome to Politics Welcome and to Right. Pol- I am Egberto Willis, your host. Good morning, Houston. How are how is everybody doing today? I trust everybody's doing fine. Look, folks, we have a great show for you today. Uh, the first, the, the beginning of the show is going to be an interview that I did yesterday with uh, the one and only Tom Hartman. But before we get started, I'd like to throw back to the studio to say, Senor Howard Reynolds and Senor Jacques Van Beber, how are my favorite peeps doing in the studio? Well, good morning, Egberto. We're doing just fine. The tin cans and string have held up, and we've actually added a new feature that we'll uh, try out later on. Uh, here is Jack to tell us his uh, thoughts for the day. Okay, I got a little. I got a little ditty here. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Egberto. It's good, good, it's good morning, Jack. Boy, sorry about yesterday. Uh, uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, I thought that might be McCartney with the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> but wait a minute. I, you know, it, it's funny because I hadn't heard that. And as, as uh, Jack was saying that, I'm like, hey, Jack, good one, man. Good one. Because... Jack has a way with words. You know, when we sit down and talk, sometimes he come out and he, he'll say certain things and it's like, oh, yeah, that's true, you know, that's true. Anyway, thanks for those words of wisdom from El Senor MLK. Uh, anyhow, folks, we got a great show today. The title of the show is Tom Hartman Visits to Talk Democracy. Asset managers, second topic, asset managers invest big in nuclear and cluster bombs. Tom Hartman discussed his new book, The Hidden History of American Democracy in Terms of Today's Struggling Democracy. I love the book. Uh, What I love most of all, folks, is the following. A lot of times we have a lot of folks who write books, but uh, in the book themselves, as they complain, and I'm not talking about novels. I'm talking about uh, re- books of uh, talking about real history or or or, or not not uh, fantasy, real things, right? You know, I wrote a book called "As I See It: Class Warfare: The Only Resort to Right Wing Doom," which in which I was hard at on the economic system, etc., and these other issues. But the one thing I tried to do is to make sure that you don't just complain. Uh, you don't just try to make it seem like somebody else is at fault. You do two things, and that is you talk about solutions and you talk about the personal responsibility that you have to work towards solutions. A lot of folks like to sit back and just uh, and complain. Uh, don't do that. I believe in we are the solution. So if you remember from yesterday's show, I, I, I started to mention quite a few things. as saying, no, nope. uh, I think I was talking to Tag at the time, uh, one of our regular callers. And when, uh, when Tag sort of said, I kind of throw the hands up in the air, I said, no, 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 no. What we do is we can actually make the change because you know what? In as much as we have democracy problems, as Tom Hartman's going to talk about, we have control still. We still have control and we still have the, 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 the tentacles of democracy within us. But without further ado and without me doing all this talking, let's go ahead and listen to El Senor Tom Hartman. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we are honored once again to speak to the one and only Tom Hartman, the pro- progressive radio host. I call the progressive radio host extraordinaire. Tom Hartman is a four time winner of the Project Censored Award, a New York Times bestselling author of, of more than 33 books. Uh, how much is it up to right now? I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, all right. I, I just wanted to break in with that. Anyway, he's America's number one progressive talk show host. His show is syndicated on local for-profit and non-profit stations and broadcast nationwide and worldwide, including at our station here, KPFT 90.1 FM Houston. It is also simulcast at, uh, on Holmes, WW Hidden History Books. Dot com. Anyway, today we are here to discuss quite a bit, but Tom, welcome to Politics Done Right again. Hey, Egberto, it's great to be back with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, let me tell you, uh, what we are, we are here to discuss, again, another one of your impressive books. I've not been able to read it word for word, but just a table of contents and other word, uh, otherwise, 
tells us that it's yet another misread. It covers a lot of things, folks, that we've covered right through this entire uh, this entire program with regards to our democracy. And it's called The Hidden History of American Democracy, in which Tom covered quite a bit. That it is apropos in these times, especially with what we hope Donald Trump, the American trader, hopefully going to jail. Uh, anyhow, Senor, how are you doing today? Why did you write this book? And I know it's a silly question, but our audience wants to know. No, it's a great question. Um, I, I wrote the book because there are so many misconceptions, many of which are being uh, promoted or exploited by right wingers about the, the foundation of this country. Uh, you know, uh, right wingers saying we're a Christian nation. We're not uh, that the founders wanted it to be a Christian nation. They didn't. Um, that democracy is an abnormal thing, they say. Uh, and it's just a, an idea somebody came up with. And really, you know, we can kind of set it aside and just make Donald Trump emperor and everything will be fine. That's more normal. You know, a thousand years of history in Europe. Um, that's not true. Um, you know, democracy is actually our default state. Um, the, the theory that the Constitution was written exclusively for rich white men uh, to protect their wealth, an idea that rich white men love to promote, uh, but it's not true. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of myths that I wanted to, bubbles that I wanted to burst, as it were, myths that I wanted to pop with uh, this book. And I think I, I, I hope I've done a good job of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I went through it and it was like, wow, he touches on everything. First of all, let me, let me tell you, the um, David Cobb, a friend of mine, I think a friend of just about everybody in the progressive space and who yeah. ran once for president of the United States. Once we had a long night discussion, he said the Constitution is nothing more than a capital document. I want to mm -hmm. start there. Is that something that you could agree with? Well, if you define capital as private property, yeah, the Constitution does acknowledge you know private property and and uh, protect it in some ways. Um, but uh, back in the in in the nineteen twenties, uh, in nineteen twenty nine, actually, Charles Beard and Mary Beard, his wife, uh, they were professors of history at Columbia University. He was a Marxist, or yeah, excuse me, he was a socialist. She was a Marxist. And they published what was probably the best selling American history during that period from the 1930s to the 1950s called, you know, the history of the United States from a, uh, a Marxist economic analysis point of view. Uh, Beard also wrote a book uh, called An Economic Analysis of the Constitution, making that argument. And in 1956, Forrest MacDonald, a, a historian and, and scholar, decided that he would see, you know, was there any truth to this? <laughs> Going back to, you know, what was the intent of the people who wrote it? What was who were the people who wrote it? And what was the intent of the people who ratified the Constitution? And what he found was that, uh, first off, it, the wealthiest of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, uh, there were a number of people who owned a lot of land. Uh, Jefferson and Washington, for example, but land was cheap then. And he just stole it from the Indians. And uh, it really wasn't a measure of wealth. In fact, in many ways, it was a kind of a ball and chain. You know, you you had to work the land and there were obligations and in some cases, even taxes. Jefferson died in bankruptcy. George Washington could not afford to free the slaves that he had promised to to free on his death. Um, his estate was gone within a generation. James Madison, his family could only hold on to his estate for uh, about a decade, a couple of decades after his death. None of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence left any multi-generational wealth of consequence, and none of them left multi-generational wealth that lasted more than two generations. There were no Rockefellers. There were no um, DuPonts or Morgans or, or, you know, like that among the founders. There were people of that kind of wealth during the founding generation. The Johnson family up on the Hudson River had a massive castle with 300 European uh, retainers who, who wore knights suits of armor and things, you know, I mean, there were some just obscenely rich people in the United States. Virtually all of them got their wealth from their connections to either the British Royal Family or the East India Company. And all of them pretty much uh, left the country uh, during the Revolutionary War. The Johnson family fled to Canada, for example. So uh, the wealthiest of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence was uh, uh, was John Hancock and his wealth 
in today's dollars was around seven hundred thousand dollars. He was, you know, so what first off, what we're talking about is the upper middle class, not the not the morbidly rich of the era. Uh, and that was the declaration. You look at the Constitution. Um, the people who helped write the Constitution, there were there were no genuinely rich people among that crowd. Um, there were a lot of lawyers. There were a lot of school teachers, um, the, the, you know, uh, politicians. Uh, they were not particularly wealthy. Um, James Madison uh, promised everybody that he would keep their deliberations secret for 50 years until everyone had died. And he kept that promise. They weren't published until after his death, uh, 50 years later. <laughs> He was very young at the time. He was in his late 20s, early 30s. And uh, the reason why, it turns out, is because they were betraying their class. They were betraying the, or in their opinions, they were betraying the wealthy people. So McDonald then went and looked at the... Let's get a stop a second, Tom, because you just enlightened me with something that I didn't know. Because there were many times that I, 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 I said some stark things about the founding fathers, but you're telling me that in as much as the found that that the, many of the founding fathers were really be, benevolent guys willing to go against uh, their elitist class. Is that what you just did? I understand that right. Yeah, I, I'm not sure benevolent is, you know, it might be a little too gushy, but yeah, they 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 believed in democracy. They believed in this experiment. Um, you know, they practiced it in a very imperfect fashion and they came from a rather bizarre time and that they were born into. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to justify, uh, for example, slavery, uh, which was the major sin of the era. But um, but yes, uh, and and they were not the the morbidly rich and they weren't trying to create a country of by and for the morbidly rich. So then McDonald went and looked at the uh, 13 ratifying conventions, you know, who showed up to ratify the Constitution in each one of these states in 1789. And what he found, again, was that the genuinely rich people in each one of the states opposed the Constitution. Patrick Henry is a great example. He was the richest man of Virginia. He was the largest slaveholder in Virginia. He held over 360 people in bondage. And, and he opposed the Constitution. At the ratifying convention, he stood up and spoke against it. Um, in fact, James Madison modified the Second Amendment. Just, you know, I think you and I have talked about this when my book on guns came out. Um, right. Just sat satisfy Patrick Henry's paranoia that a president might call up the Virginia militia, which was also their slave patrol, and thus, you know, break the, the, the hold of slavery in the state. Um, he changed the word nation to the word state in the Second Amendment. So, yeah, that, that, that would. Oh, and what Forrest McDonald found was that in every single one of the 13 states and, the, you know, I've got the information in my book, but you can also read his book. It was published in 1956. Um, it's not in print any longer, but you can find used copies fairly easily. Um, you know, he found that in state after state, the people who were in favor of the Constitution were the people who were in debt, teachers, lawyers, which was not a well-paid profession in, in most cases, um, uh, you know, small subsistence farmers. And the people who opposed the Constitution were the genuinely wealthy people, uh, particularly the industrialist class, which was just beginning to emerge. And people who had had, you know, long associations with the British royal family and the, and the East India Company. So, you know, that's the history. I mean, you can look it up. Oh, well, and it's, it's bizarre how it gets danced around. I mean, I, I, I think I, I might have mentioned that on Wikipedia, it says, you know, George Washington's estate it was worth a billion dollars. He was a rich man in his time. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, he couldn't literally then, couldn't afford to, to, to free his own slaves. He, you know, land was right. cheap. So good. it is important for us to um, to know that because, like I said, you, you know, you come to the wrong conclusions about our democracy and 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 these folks that are running around with Trump right now it's amazing how wrong they have it from us being founded on a on the christian nation etc 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 but uh, you, you have a chapter in the book called did rich white guys create the united states just to guarantee their own privilege power and slaves yeah that's what you and i were just talking about that, that right chapter. so i, I think <laughs> in effect sure. in effect you you and I, and again it, that that is something that i think many progressives themselves would be out there. Not only conservatives would 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 would, would deny that, but pro but progressives were out there talking a whole lot about that. Now, in this in this particular sec a a group of chapters, you talk about the way the country was structured democratically. Um, uh, your thoughts on that? Because I, in all the studying that I've done in the reading of the Constitution, I find it a very flawed document. Personally, I'm no scholar, but I find it a very flawed document that I that I think all the compromises that were made 
actually made it not a democracy. Your thoughts? Well, it, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, keep in mind, this was they were trying something that had never before been done. Um, you know, the, the Roman Republic bore very little resemblance to, to us. I mean, they had an institution called the Senate. That's about it. The Greek democracy was com- organized in a completely different fashion. I mean, you know, you had um, basically jury duty. You know, you everybody had to serve for a year, 6,001 people to, to, you know, to create a consensus or to create a, I forget the name of the body, the right. Greek body. Um, and, uh, so this was, this was a brand new experiment and it was based largely on, on, uh, the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, frankly. And I, and I document that in some detail in the book and, and, you know, they were trying to adapt that to a society that was not Iroquois, that was not, uh, you know, a hunting gathering society or a marginally agricultural society. And, uh, there were a lot of compromises, you know, admittedly, but, you know, the, the, the point of democracy, I think the biggest point about democracy that I make in the book and, and the biggest myth about democracy, uh, particularly that gets promoted by conservatives is that democracy is this weird thing that some smart people came up with. Um, but it's not normal for humans. Um, what's normal is the way Europe was for a thousand years, where you got a king and you got the barons and then you got all the serfs. And that's what's normal. And that's really, you know, what if left to our own devices, we would recreate because that's normal for humanity. And it turns out that's complete BS. Um, uh, and, and not just for humans, by the way. Um, back about a decade and a half ago, uh, two uh, British scientists, Roper and Conrad, uh, uh, proposed in, a, in an article in Nature that um, we would find that this mythology of the alpha animal in nature, that the, you know, there's an alpha wolf and an alpha deer and an alpha elk and, you know, that the alpha animal rules the, pe- rules the herd, uh, that that would be completely false. That what we would find was that the alpha animal would have first selection of sexual partner of, of mates, um, which comports with natural selection to pass along strongest right. genes. But that would be it. They would not be the decision makers. And uh, James Randerson and a group of scientists put this to the test with uh, uh, a herd of red deer in the forest that was owned by a university at Essex uh, in the UK, putting uh, cameras in the trees. And asking the question, you know, when do the deer decide to go to which one of the three watering holes in this forest and how do they make that decision? And it turned out that the deer would be grazing and uh, they would start pointing their bodies at one of the three watering holes, different deer. And when 51 percent of them were pointing at one of the water holes, the entire herd would kind of form and head to that watering hole. Democracy. So, you know, in our Constitution. Not only is it a 50 percent plus one to pass laws and things like that, but for really difficult things like amending the Constitution, dangerous things, we require a supermajority. So what Ray Anderson and his scientists did was they put uh, they staked a a predator near each one of the three watering holes and said, "Okay, now let's see what the deer do. You know, and then what it took was 66 percent of the deer pointing at a particular watering hole to head to that watering hole. Um, so, you know, that supermajority exists in nature as well. So I, I called up Ken Conrad and I said, what happened when you published this in nature? And he was like, oh, I got all this feedback. You know, this bug guy called me up and said with gnats, you know, ball of gnats in the air, like in the summer. And you see this ball of gnats and then it goes zoop, right. zoop, zoop, like that. And how do they know when to move? Right. Are they telepathic? No. With every wing beat, every gnat is voting. I'm going to move a little more to the left. And with 51 percent of them move a little more to the left, the whole ball is moves to the left. He said he heard from a fish guy, you know, and the theologist. Yeah, this is this accounts for schooling behavior. Again, I always thought fish must be telepathic because there's not a lead fish going, hey, let's go to the right. I mean, at least with geese, you know, they're honking at each other. You think maybe they're talking. Right, right. But, you know, not fish. Um, well, it turns out they're not telepathic. Every every motion is a vote. The same with with birds flying and flocking. You know, you'll see a, a, a flock of crows going across the sky and suddenly it just goes yeah, like that. You know? Well, how do they know to do that? Well, it's it, they're literally voting with every wing beat. And, uh, you know, the conclusion that they came to in this, this study that ultimately was also published in Nature was that um, d- democracy is the default mode in all animals. I mean, you know, from ants to primates and the founders. Uh, were particularly uh, fond of this idea. They actually believed this to be the case. Uh, so much so 
that when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, you know, he was talking about uh, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he said this was the goal of nature's God. You know, he talks about nature's God in the Declaration. Right, right. And he hands this off to John Adams to edit. And John Adams, of course, was a Christian. John Adams scratches out nature's God and puts in the Christian God, right? And he get, and Jefferson gets it back and scratches out the Christian God and writes nature's God. And it's still there in the Declaration of Independence, nature's God. They believed that the natural state was small d democratic. And the goal was to have as much democracy as possible, which is why the first among equals, uh, and they're not really equals. But the first among the three branches of the government, the, the first among the four parts of the three branches People's of government house. was the House of Representatives, because it's the closest mm-hmm. to people. The Senate then came out of a compromise, the big state, small state compromise. The presidency, the the, the Electoral College, uh, you know, we can talk about that if you want. It's in the book, Why the Electoral College. But that was designed to to uh, try to avoid a president who was a, a, a scam artist, a hustler, a drunk, a, a person of low moral character, to quote uh, Alexander Hamilton. And but then the opposite the, it turned out the opposite is what occurred, right? I, yeah, sadly. Um, and then this, I mean, the, the, the Electoral College became an anachronism within 50 years uh, of its of its creation uh, because of the telegraph. And because of, uh, you know, the Pony Express and things. But when when they wrote the Constitution, the problem was, you know, there was I mean, not only was there no telegraph, I, you know, Ben Franklin was flying kites and thunderstorms. They were they didn't even have electricity. It was late. Right. And that was it. And so it could take two, three. And we didn't have a, a, a really comprehensive postal system at all. And so it could take two, three weeks. It could take a month for a letter to make it from Georgia to Washington, D.C. Right. So, so how would a voter in Georgia know who to vote for for president? Um, there were no national newspapers. There was no telegraph. There's no radio or television. So the the what they came up with was that they, the Georgians would not vote for president. They would vote for people who were pledged to particular candidates for president. But they were actually voting for these electors. And the electors would then go to physically to Washington, D.C., where on December 15th, they would cast their votes. and physically being in D.C., they would interview the candidates. And if they concluded that the people of Georgia had voted for a guy who was really a scoundrel, they wouldn't they wouldn't cast their vote for, which is why you have, you know, faithless electors. They they literally wrote that in the Constitution. I mean, you know, it it was a great kind of safety valve protection system against a Donald Trump kind of person. But uh, like I said, by the time the Pony Express and the Telegram came, the Telegraph came along, you know, in the 1830s and 1840s, it was completely anachronistic. It was completely out of date. And we should have gotten rid of it 150 years ago. We almost did, by the way. We came within one vote in the Senate of getting rid of the Electoral College in the 1970s. In the 1970s. It was 74. Okay. I need to to go back and look. It, it it needs to go because, I mean, in as much as they did it for uh, good purposes, in my opinion, again, it was... It was never a real fail safe, uh, a, a, a real sale fail safe. And look at what we've had. Every time that it, it that it misfired, it misfired for a particular kind of person. It's amazing. George W. Bush and Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, you know, Bush lost by I mean, half. Same minute. kind Bush of vote, lost right? Three minutes. Yeah, yeah. So it's time to get rid you of know, the electoral college. But I'm glad to hear that that Nate. You know, I I, I speak a lot about most people being good. And in as much as most people being good, you know, um, we just have these charlatanes out here that that like Donald Trump and others. But my question then about democracy and and I want to go into something great about your book is that a lot of times you write these books and it tells you about all the different problems that you have. What I like about your book is at the end of the book, you have an itemized list of solutions that we yeah. have to work towards if we want to maintain our democracy. But before we get there, I'd like to ask about um how do we handle the mindset of people? Because that animals, which we are, are inherently democratic, but that we have allowed an autocratic streak because of being ill-informed and brainwashed. Mm -hmm. I guess animals don't get brainwashed because they don't have our intellect. How can we mitigate that in your opinion? Because that is my task, your task, and the task of many doing this kind of work. 
Well, and that was the founding generation's task, too. I mean, uh, Jefferson repeatedly wrote, I, I do not trust the rich to protect this nation. I mean, you know, he, he said that a half a dozen different ways at different times. And, and not only him, I mean, multiple founders uh, trash talked the, 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 the morbidly rich of their time. Um, uh, it's a real challenge. I mean, it, we have uh, we've seen uh, Jefferson identified three groups that, that were oppressive in the history of Europe, um, and that was warlords, uh, people who conquered by force of violence, theocrats, popes, typically, and and the morbidly rich, um, the you know, the 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 the, the lords, the barons and the. Uh, you know, their goal in, in creating this document was to have the, the power derive, as the declaration says, derive from the consent of the government. And so with all of my solutions in the end of the book, they're all put in the context of if the goal of American democracy, of our American republic, is to have something close to a democracy, the essence of a democracy is that what the majority of people want is what they get. And so if you look at, I mean, I don't think there's a single thing in my solutions chapter that doesn't pull well over 50%. And yet we don't have them for this reason that you just identified, which is we've been conquered. We've been conquered by the morbidly rich. And it really started in 1971. I mean, it, it has happened a couple of times in our history. It, the, the morbidly rich rose up in the 1830s. Uh, I think you and I talked about this when my book about American oligarchy came out. Right. Um, you know, the cotton gin and how that contributed to uh, fewer than 2,000 families ending up completely controlling the entire, all the politics and economics of the South. And, uh, you know, we fought a civil war over that. Um, then, then you had the rise of the robber barons again in the 1880s, 1890s. And then there was, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, and the trust buster going after them. And then you had the morbidly rich rising again in the 1920s and, and, you know, leading to the Republican Great Depression. And then Franklin Roosevelt went after them. So by 71, the, 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 the rich people had by and large excluded themselves from politics. And, and that's when Lewis Powell came along and said, you know, if, if yeah. uh, rich people and corporations don't get involved in politics, we're going to find ourselves on the outside looking in, you know, because Ralph Nader is really popular and he's a communist, essentially. And, uh, and he called him out. He calls out Ralph Nader in the, in the Powell doc, in the Powell memo. That was in 71. In 72, Richard Nixon put him on the Supreme Court. In 76, uh, he voted on the Buckley decision, which said that uh, bribing politicians shall no longer be called bribery it's because speech. money is not money, it's speech, right? And in 78, he actually wrote the decision in the Buckley versus uh, First National Bank or the F Bilotti versus First National Bank uh, decision, um, or First National Bank versus Frank Bilotti, uh, in which he said that not only is money free speech, but that uh, corporations are persons and they're entitled to use free speech this way. <laughs> that was a killer. Oh, yeah. And it was. And that and that the result of that was an, a, a, just a tsunami of mostly oil industry money flowing into the Republican Party and floating Ronald Reagan into the White House as, you know, in reaction to Jimmy Carter creating a solar bank that would have had 20 percent of the nation's electricity being generated by the year 2000. Um, you know, he put, Carter put that into place in, in uh, 79, I think it was. And um, he, he had, actually put the panels on this, the roof of the um, of the right. White House that Reagan summarily removed uh, as soon as he got there. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, this was this was the beginning. Um, uh, there's there's another kind of backstory to it that I don't think is in this book. I think it's in my book on oligarchy. But in 1951, Russell Kirk wrote a book called The Conservative Mind, um, in which he argued that the American middle class was growing very rapidly. It was uh, closing in on 50 percent of Americans at that time in 1951. It was in the mid 40s. And he said, if it ever reaches there's some kind of a threshold here, probably well over 50 percent, where if the American middle class class reaches that threshold, it will throw America into social chaos because people who have never had money don't know how to handle money. People who have never had political power don't know how to handle political power. This is essentially the same argument that, that the Dixiecrats made about giving political power to black people in the South, mm -hmm. that it would be a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. And and, you know, Kirk was considered a crackpot by most Republicans in 1951 when he published this book. William F. Buckley and Barry Goldwater thought he was a genius, but that was about it. But then came the 60s. In 61, the birth control was, pill was legalized and within three years was widespread. And boom, you had the women's movement um, in, in you had the civil rights movement was growing like a weed in the 60s. In 64, you got, you know, the, the Civil Rights Act, 65, the Voting Rights Act. 
uh, he, he, Martin Luther King and, and all the, you know all of the various parts of the black movement, uh, the civil rights movement. Um, and then uh, you also had the, the war in Vietnam and you had young men saying, hell no, I'm not going to go, which was exactly what Russell Kirk had predicted, that women would no longer know their place, that minorities would no longer know their place, and that even the children of, of you know, of the, of the white upper class would start to rebel. And that's literally what happened in the 60s, what he predicted in 1951. Now, it didn't happen for the reasons that he predicted that there was uh-huh. too big a class, it happened for you know exogenous regions, other you know external reasons like you know the development of the birth control pill, but it happened. And so in the seventies, that's why Lewis Powell wrote the Powell Memo, and that's why the mandate that Reagan had when he came into office in nineteen eighty one was to cut the middle class down to size. And when he came into office, the middle class was two thirds of us. You know, one third of America had a good union job, which set the wage and benefit floor locally so that two thirds of Americans had the equivalent of a good union job and had a middle class where one wage earner could buy a home, buy a car, a new car every two years, take a vacation every year and have enough money left over for retirement and to put their kids through school. Uh, I mean, that was my family. That was my dad. He worked in a tool and die shop. And and that was the life he had, although he didn't put me through school. But, you know, um, Mm -hmm. that was the middle class. So Reagan set out to destroy the middle class to save America. And I mean, these guys really believed that they were saving America. I, I, you know what, Tom, I think you give them a lot of credit. I don't I wonder if they really want to save America as you know, one of the things that I say, and, and correct me if you think I'm wrong here, because my contention is that they don't want a strong middle class. They don't want an educated people because an educated people would ask about our economic system. Why would we work so hard? for so little to ensure that so many get so much. In effect, well, they are all on our backs. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the essence of the union movement. And, and that's what built the American middle class. And that's why when Reagan set out to destroy the middle class, the first thing he attacked was the union movement. And we went from a third of Americans being unionized when he came into office to by the time the, the Reagan Bush uh, 12 years was over, down to about 10 percent. You know, I think we're around six or eight percent in private workforce now in the union movement. Crazy. So I, I yeah. think your analysis is right. But I don't think that they were sitting around saying, you know, people will start questioning, you know, like having Marxist analysis, you know, economic analysis of power. No, they just didn't want people to have unions. They didn't want to have to pay right. people well. Uh, you know, it was, it was much simpler than that. But, you know, a, a lot of uh, among the theoreticians, you know, the, the Buckleys and the Goldwaters, they I, I really having read their work and having, you know, been steeped in their work when I was a kid. Um, uh, I, I really believe that they they thought they were doing the best thing. I don't think that uh, by the end of his term, Reagan thought he was doing the right thing or the people around him. I think they just thought they were dancing to the tune of the really rich. Wait, who now. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying you thought Reagan didn't think he was doing a bad thing? You think Reagan really thought he was saving the country? I think he thought that at the beginning. I don't think uh-huh. you know, by the end. I mean, he was full of long dementia. So who knows? But yeah, right. I don't right. think George Herbert Walker Bush thought that. I think he thought he was making America safe for aristocracy because he was a member of the aristocratic, aristocratic class. You know, his 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 grandfather was the senator and the and the wealthy banker and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Anyhow, um, we don't have a lot of time here. So what I'm going to ask you to do, Tom, is if you can, uh, you know, you have a whole lot of solutions. And I think that's what this is all about, guys, the solutions that that are here in the book. Why don't you give me your three tops? Well, again, these are things that the majority of Americans want. And the only reason we don't have them is because the Supreme Court has legalized political bribery. So, you know, I'd say to begin with, everybody in America should have health care. It should be part of the commons and it should be administered by the government or at least paid for by the government, single payer like Canada does. And uh, it, it would cost half as much. And you wouldn't have, you know, people like uh, Dollar Bill McGuire, the guy who started, you know, United Healthcare, who walked away with a billion, one point four billion dollars. I mean, this that's obscene. Every penny of that was taken from somebody, you know, from saying to somebody, "No, we won't pay for your liver transplant." Exactly. Um, so, number one, healthcare. Number two, education. What we learned from the GI Bill, uh, which my dad went to college on, he only went for two years. My wife's dad went all the way through law school and ended up the assistant attorney general for the state of Michigan, um, and and he came from a dirt poor, like literally no running water family, um, is that um, the 
education is an investment. What we learned from the GI Bill was that for every dollar that the federal government invested in educating young people coming back from World War II, mostly young men, um, but nonetheless young people, um, was that we got $7 of return on investment in additional tax revenue because educated people earn more and they mm-hmm. stimulate the economy. And, uh, you know, there there is no way that education is an expense. It's an investment. And that's why we are literally the only country on earth uh, or developed country on earth where there's a, a student debt crisis. Now, you know, every other country subsidizes higher education like we did until 1980. Uh, or until the yeah. 1980s. I mean, you know, Reagan ended free college in California as governor in the 70s. And then when he came into into the White House, he cut his, one of his first cuts was a 25 grand. Yeah. yeah, 25% across the board cut to federal education support. And that began the gutting of the American public education system. So uh, number two would be public education. I'd say number three, and it's a very vital one, is, is establishing an absolute right to vote. So that Republican governors can no longer purge you from the voting rolls. They can no longer make you stand in line for 12 hours. They can no longer, you know, they can no longer make you jump through 16 different hoops. You automatically get registered as soon as you turn 18, like in every other democratic country in the world. Um, You know, it's it's we have these bizarre systems that are purely the result of rich people having been given the power to own politicians by a corrupt Supreme Court. So those are my top three. The name of. The name of the book, the, Hi- the Hidden History of American Democracy. Read this. And I love the subtitle, Rediscovering Humanity's Ancient Way of Living. Rediscovering American Ancient Way of Living. From the New York Times bestselling author, Tom Hartman. Thank you so kindly once again, Tom. You know, um, I revere your work. Thank you so kindly for being once again on Politics Done Right. It, thank you so much, Alberto, for inviting me. It's so nice talking with you. I appreciate it. All right, folks, that was Tom Hartman on uh, his new book on democracy. And it's, I think, apropos, especially for these times, um, you know, um, it, it, you wonder sometimes, again, you get the genesis of the country, how the country started, and the things that 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 we've gone through. How could we possibly be here. I, I don't want to say again, because the truth is we've never been here, but how can we be here? How can we have a country right now that's on the, uh, that's teetering on fascism? And that's not hyperbole at all. A country that is teetering on fascism. Anyhow, folks, the telephone number is 713-526-5738. All lines are open. I'd love to hear your thoughts. 713-526-5738. Love to hear what you thought about the uh, the, the, the topic that, uh, that was covered by Tom Hartman. What you think about these issues? I want to see those lines filled up. 713-526-5738. I have another topic. Do remember, you can always go to Politics Done Right dot com slash uh, newsletter to see all of the topics that we cover on every show, whether we get to the topic or not. That is 713-526-5738. Very important, 713-526-5738. I'm going to be going to the lines uh, right now. We have one call so far, but please go ahead and give us a call. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So let's go to Anonymous and um, and move on from there. Anonymous, how are you doing this morning? Hello. So, so was he promoting the Powell memo? Is that what I heard? Oh, no, 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 no. He wasn't promoting the Powell memo. He was pointing out the fact that the Powell memo is directly responsible for a lot of our anti-democratic, uh, th- the, the anti-democratic things that are occurring in our society at this point. I don't know if you if know if you're a listener of our show regularly, but we have several blogs we've written on the Powell memo and how it's destroyed the minds of many or schools, etc., with the things that it promotes. Go ahead, anonymous. Have you have you heard um, about? The Clergy uh, anniversary this year, 1923. Uh, this guy from Europe named uh, Clergy was wrote a, a plan to 
invade Europe, Europe with uh, uh, Central, Central uh, Asia, Asia folks like we call it the Middle East these days, I think. And we are over here, you know, talking about a lot of stuff, but it's like China has pretty much taken over all the trade blocks in Euro Asia and most of the world. There's, we only have a couple of countries that we are actually. I think it's like uh, parts of Europe, uh, EU, I think, and a couple. So I'm, I'm wondering if we have all this going on around the world and they're moving on. And over here, we're focused on, uh, you know, like those guys are Trotskyites. Crystal, all those guys from the 50s, the neocons, Leo Strauss. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they're, 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 they're a created opposition to Communist Manifesto from Leon Trotsky. So, I mean, those guys had their time, and there's, that's, I think that's why we're still sort of screwed, because our policies. But Powell, that was, I mean, that was really bad, because when, you know, uh, they passed that memo, Kissinger tapped this guy named Klaus Schwab on the shoulder in 72 and the rest of history. That's 50 years of compromise in our constitution with outside business lobbying. So, I mean, we really have a detrimental type of situation going on and Europe being taken down after the century anniversary of clarity. I think you know who he is. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot going on we're, and we're still pointing fingers here at home. And this, it, well, I, I mean... The, the finger pointing serves. I, I I was trying to listen to you to get w- what the gist of your uh, discussion is. Hold, but hold one quick second, folks. Give us a call at seven one three five two six five seven three eight. The lines are wide open. Seven one three five two six five seven three eight. Hit extension two, and we'll get you on air right away. Yeah, uh, anonymous. Here here is a deal. Um, uh, yeah, we have a lot of problems. I want to address two things that you said. Um, one once you said you talk about. Uh, what China is doing as a, I, I, I don't know in what context you're talking about China, good or bad, but I tell you economic, what, con- economic, say that again? Economic. Right. Let me tell you economically. It's not bad, just, just the fact, it's just, there's no bias there, there's no opinion. Okay, just, good. I'm glad that you said that. I am glad that you said no opinion here because let me just give you some contrast here. And this, this has nothing to do with, uh, with opinion. Uh, China is all over the world, benevolent or not. China is all over the world. Uh, and the kinds of things that it's doing in countries from Jamaica to Argentina to Costa Rica to Panama to, to, uh, to many of the countries in Africa right now is it's using its financial power on building things. So far, what we've done in the last several, since since the neocons have taken full hold of America is we have been bombing things. I want you to realize that whenever we, we talk about doing things, you don't see us doing a whole lot of uh, uh, investments that build up people around the world. I, I want you to really ask yourself, I can go to any one of these countries that I mentioned and you'll see a big stamp that says these roads being built in collaboration, like the, the new freeway that was built in Jamaica, in collaboration with, with China, the new uh, roads that were built in Nairobi, uh, with, in collaboration with China. How do you get friends? How do you get people to like you? Whether you're doing it for benevolent reasons or not, you don't do it with... I think uh, it's just uh, business. I think it's just business, I mean... No, but what I, uh, let, let me finish. And uh, let me finish. I, I, I think I made you talk, but let me, let me just finish because it's an important statement here. Um, when you talk about we stay here in the United States pointing fingers, you're absolutely right. That is what our, our media, that is what many of us have allowed ourselves to devolve into. And in the process, it was done on purpose because we ask, why is it that we are blowing up a whole lot of things while China is building a whole lot of things? Because the people who run our government makes a profit from the military industrial complex, from the oil industrial complex. I and appreciate you going through this, the, the exercise of what we do, but what I'm trying to say is if the same folks that finance Western mercantilism, the Americas, 
and basically stood up this uh, you know brave new world or what you want to call it this republic this beacon this bastion and it's used to finally foreclose all resistance all central banks are deployed at the same time concurrently using the century of shame suppressing china with the heroin the bassoon out of turkey around they stood them up we we installed mao shang kai-shek and now we're going into a new chapter and it's it's really neat to see how they stood us up temporary you know bretton woods uh, okay. And the next, next 22nd, it's going to be pretty big with that announcement of Brits, uh, SDR, IMF sponsored that IMF is allowing the Yuhan being used <laughs> to pay back all Argentina's day, all uh, Afghanistan. It's really going on right now. A lot of stuff blowing, going, and here we are. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, mob, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, look, uh, uh, thank you very much for calling, my friend. I understand what you're saying. And by the way, I think I recognize your voice as other than anonymous, but I won't mention it no, in no, case I make a mistake. Don't, don't have to say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. You have a great day. All right. Let's see. Anyway, folks, um, the next topic is uh, U.S. asset managers have significant investments in nuclear weapons and cluster bombs. But before I go to that, I think I better go to Mike, who just called in. Let's come on to the air, Mike. Mike, you're on. All right. I think Mike. Well, we're yeah. getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, Come on I in. think we can get. There, yeah, where's Mike? All right. All right. Yeah. Here I am. Got me? got me? Yes, I got you, Mike. All right. All right. About the uh, China dominant. Their corporations pay or at least partially owned by their government. So their government is getting the right of getting money that a corporation could be contributing to our treasury. So they're benefiting from their way of running their government. You can call it communism. You can call it whatever you want. I call it survival because if you're benefiting from the labor force, you should contribute to the treasury that the labor force contributes to also. Look at the comparison. Corporations here, they don't contribute their fair share. Look at what all we're lacking. Education is pitiful. Your care is none existent for the masses. And you, they want to cut everything. And they want the middle class and those that are working to subsidize the portions or the percentages of the taxes that should be paid by corporations. So you can complain about China. China is in survival mode, dominating mode, and they're exhibiting it around the world. What's your opinion? First of all, how am I going to disagree with a factual statement? I can't disagree with a factual statement. The fact of the matter is, in America, corporations and, and the wealthy build all of that on the backs of everybody else. It's not, it's not, a, it's not, it's not, a, that is not even something that's, that one should discuss. That's why we use a whole lot of smoke and mirrors here, right? Because we, uh, l- let me ask you this. Let's think about somebody who has $1 billion. What could they have provided to society to be one bi- to have extracted one billion worth of capital out of society. That one human being couldn't possibly work for that. What that means is that we have an economic system that has created a mechanism for one person to be able to, u- to, to, to use everybody else to enrich themselves. It's an economic system. And what we've learned from the beginning of our lives in America is that somehow that is fear because if you have an idea, you should be able to make money on that idea unlimitedly, even though that idea had to be implemented by hundreds of people, thousands of people, millions of people. Let's use I always use Bill Gates as an example because I think of Bill Gates as a good guy. In other words, Bill Gates is a, is a good guy who became a multi-billionaire in a flawed economic system. What do I mean by that? Bill Gates did not invent much, right? When Bill Gates started, he, uh, IBM was looking for a, a, an operating system for a new computer they didn't know would be a success. And in so doing, in so doing, Bill Gates, because of his position, 
because of his contacts, he went ahead and said, wait a minute, I know this guy in Seattle who has a kind of a operating system built already. I'll pen this system to IBM, not sell it to IBM, license it, and in the process make billions as I expanded on that with other people's intellect. But he was the one who made billions, and a few of his cohorts were the ones who made billions. But the ones who created all of this were hundreds of thousands of us. And we feel it's okay for that guy to have a good guy because he's giving it all away. And I, you know, I would if he wasn't giving it away, I was I would be, you know, I would be even more upset. But again, it's not re- it was it wasn't really his. The problem I have with billionaires is that we have given them an undemocratic way to redistribute money, which is not a fair economic system. So I, that, breaking that right back down to you, Mike, which I said, how can I disagree with a factual statement? The corporations are built on the back of all of us, and there's no nothing specifically intellectual about them that make them better than many of than many of the folks that are working for them right now. And you say, Mike, I say you're right, right? Because they're not that one individual is not contributing to the success of the company. It's taking off cooperative of all those employees, but we have laws that are ready to benefit those individuals from paying their fair share. So I'm back to making it personal. You have to get involved, like Tom would say. Politics is not a spectator sport. You got to get involved, just like President Obama. You got to get involved. You can't sit around and complain. It's time to go to work. If you don't see the changes that's not benefiting us, I don't know what to tell you because you're not paying attention in class. I call life a class. You attend class every day. And you better be paying attention. I think when you just, I just think you spoke uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the right word, if you will, because you have to get engaged. And if you don't get engaged, then we don't. We are unable to move forward. But anything else you'd like to add, Mike, before we uh, go on to the next subject or if somebody else call 713-526-5738, extension numero dos, extension number two, 713-526-573. Go ahead. For the conversation. Have a good day. You have a wonderful day, my friend. Our, go ahead, our, our Senor Reynolds. Oh, I was just uh, testing out the intercom system, so I didn't have to get on the air. Ah, uh, you well, you got the seconds left. left. Yeah, uh, you're, you're 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 on the air. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it wasn't. Well, you I know, uh, let, let, let let me tell you what just happened there. Um, I am I'm talking to uh, Howard. Right, I, I'm I'm trying to pull your name out of the air when this guy uh, Mike was talking, and I'm like, you know, you're speaking. Ugh. I, I, I was about to call you Harold Howard. I don't know what happened at this time of the morning. Maybe it's that I a need lot to of get the- have made that same <laughs> error. I've been called Harold so many times. It's <laughs> Maybe they should have named me Harold. <laughs> you know, there we go. But folks, 713-526-5738. Will you be the third caller? 713-526-5738. You can be on air right away. I can I can either talk about what we've been talking about or we can go ahead and speak on the other issue but here comes the calls uh 713-526-5738 um you know i I love what mike had to say because what i'm trying to build into all of us here right is the power that we have not implied but that we actually have and that i want us to use so let's go to brian come on in brian yeah, you there? you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, I'd like to talk uh, about the last caller, about uh, communism and the yes, uh, uh, economic system is in China. China? Yes. Any idea what the Belt and Road system is? Would you explain yes. this stuff? Yeah, okay. what do you mean? The, the, road, the, roads, the, the roads that they go build around the, the, the world and the, the, the financing that goes w- with it? Yeah, yeah, that Belt and Road. What do you think that initiative is for? Uh, influence. Domination? No, influence. Influence. No, world, world domination. no, it's world domination. Do you know Xi Jinping? 
Do you know I this person? Look, I, I don't, I don't think you my do either. From Beijing, China. Brian, oh, really, really, my wife Brian? is from Beijing, China. I know Brian. very well. Communist Let me just. I understand, sir. Let me just say one, one thing here, okay? I, I, when China build roads and so forth, notice when I spoke to Mike, I wanted to have nothing to do with what's the benevolence or otherwise of what China is doing. All I'm saying is what China is doing around the world is different than what we're doing. When we influence other parts of the world, we are doing nothing different than what China is doing. We want, our, we want to have influence on that world. When you talk about how bad Xi Jinping is on how he treats people or whatever, I always say, let's look in the mirror. So let's be clear here, my friend, Brian. You are a good person. I am a good person. Now, when we talk about governments, we don't talk about good and bad. We talk about what the, the corporations within these governments and the structures do. I don't fall in love with presidents and Xi Jinping or Bush or anybody else. I just look at what's being done and okay. who is being helped. Who is going to attack a, a, a sovereign nation, Xi Jinping, on Taiwan, correct? Well, uh, wait, we attacked a sovereign nation. We attacked Panama from the United States and killed 10,000 Panamanians. Sir, it is important. I am from Panama. I am from Panama. What I'm trying to tell you, Brian, is let's be careful. Brian, I am, sir, I am from Panama. I'm telling you the history. And I'm telling you from the history and the inception of how... I was the pre-invasion for it. No, 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 sir. The history of Panama doesn't... Sir, please hold. The history of Panama does not start with the invasion. It starts with how the country was created. We wanted to build a canal. Colombia said no. We said we'll use power to take it. I'm saying let's be careful how we point fingers the and reason. The Panama Canal, not the United States. No, not Colombia. Sir, the sir, sir, the again. States. Colombia denied the United States the right to do it. And the United States said, no one can do that. We will take sovereign land. And we did it. That is, sir, I, sir, I'm giving you the history. You can either accept it or not. I'm telling you who everybody knows a canal was tried by Colombia. I mean, by the French in Colombia. Okay. Panama was Colombia. And the United States created Panama out of Colombia, but we are out of time. I'm so sorry. Look, uh, call back, Brian. Let's talk about this tomorrow. Yeah, thank you, sir. Anyway, my name is Egberto Willis. We're out of time. This is Politics Done Right. And you guys know how I end this. Baby callers, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We'll get you the next time. I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.